Thank you, David. Uh, with the wonders of Zoom, something that was very novel for us a year ago has become uh, increasingly familiar. And I'm in Maryland, uh, south of Baltimore, and uh, Soledad is in the St. Augustine area of Florida. And through the wonders of uh, Zoom, we're able to join you to talk about uh, birding in Cuba and uh, how it can be done and how we'll be arrogant enough to say how it should be done. And I'll give most of the talk. I remember the birds, the names of the birds. Sole remembers the names of the people. <laughs> and uh, she may have to help me with locations or colored, colorful details, but I'll uh, lead most of the talk and then hand it over to Sole toward the end. So she can tell you about some of the projects that the Friendship Association has been conducting in Cuba with our friends and colleagues. And Sully, you are still muted. So if you want them to say something uh, now or soon, uh, speak up. Let's see. Share. I'm going to share that screen. Here we go. And I am going to go to. There we are. So <clears throat> this is uh, a talk uh, we call Birding and Beyond in Cuba, Opportunities and Lessons. Um, you will uh, note that we could take three different orientations toward this kind of talk. One which is gravitated toward people, such as this talk. And by the way, these are people in uh, birders that we brought to Cuba. Uh, and general naturalists that we brought to, to Cuba uh, at Playa Larga near the Bay of Pigs, at the uh, top end of the Bay of Pigs. You can see Sole there, as a matter of fact, looking up. And some of you may know Larry Balch here, a former president of the American Birding Association and a good friend of mine. Well, we can focus on people, our people, our birders. We can focus on the birds. Um, or we could focus on their people. And I like to focus on their people, all three things, uh, our folks in the locations, their birds and the locations and their people. But you will notice here, I have most of my pictures in black frame, which indicates they're my photos. I have some in red, which indicates that they're somebody else's photos. And I'll let you know what they, uh, most of the time who took their photos. And I have, ones in green and to me the green ones are the most important they symbolize our engagement with our counterparts our colleagues in cuba we have here michael canisares michael is our is the former president of the zoological society if uh, correct me if i'm wrong Sole. uh he's a wonderful photographer naturalist fabulous birder uh he's usually our in-person cuban guide uh, when we go around in a bus, the dozen of us uh, around multiple places. The next fella is Rosendo Martinez. He's the former head of visitor engagement of the National Park System. Uh, that's visitor services. So he's very people oriented. And even though he's retired, he's constantly engaged in welcoming and developing a cadre of new and upcoming uh, leaders and uh, uh, people interpreters, Spanish speaking, English speaking interpreters to help all of us enjoy Cuba. The third person here is uh, our bus driver that trip, Ronel, wonderful guy, really knew his stuff. Your bus driver is crucial. He usually knows where the best places to, uh, for emergency places to get gasoline, snacks, rests, uh, bathrooms, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the, and the last person here is our friend Adrian. He's a local birder at uh, Playa Larga. He uh, opened up a casa particular, a homestay, a casa de renta, as they call it. It's like our B&Bs um, with his family at Playa Larga. He redeveloped the backyard into a feeding station and mini sanctuary. And uh, he joined us when we were at Playa Larga. We stayed many times, uh, visited and revisited his backyard. And you'll get to see some of that later. Anyhow, 
Hey, Phil Berti in Cuba. We have the opportunity to visit three core locations. Well, whoever brings you to Cuba will probably bring you to these three locations. The Vinales area, the Zapata area, and the Havana area. And we also uh, illustrate four side trips. Uh, you can't do all of these four in one trip because Guanajaca Vives, listed here, is on the extreme western side of the island. And Baracoa, one of Sole's favorite places, is on the east, extreme east end of the island. And it makes it difficult to go to both places in one particular trip. Um, there are other locations such as the North Coast and Topes de Cayantes that I'll, uh, I'll uh, bring to your attention. Hold on a second, I can't see. Yes. Um, Cuba. Cuba is a fascinating, wonderful country, so close yet so far. Um, it's 42,000 square miles, about the size of uh, Virginia or Tennessee, or the peninsula part of Florida. According to the official census uh, done about 10 years ago, Cuba's population is about 11.2 million, of whom 2.2 million more or less live in the greater, Cuban, uh, greater Havana area. Uh, the genetic makeup, which is very interesting uh, in terms of ancestry and informational uh, DNA markers, um, indicate that it's about 20, about 72 percent European, 20 percent African, with 8 percent indigenous blood going around, and um, maybe East Asian, Chinese, and Japanese, about 1 percent. The interesting thing in the island, for those people who are particularly bird oriented, there's about 400 species that have occurred. There are 26 endemics, of which 22 or 85 percent are in some deep trouble in terms of national or international concern. And some of them are my absolute favorites, like Cuban black hawk here, or Zapata wren here, uh, Cuban toady here, Cuban trogon, Fernandina's flicker. They're wonderful endemics. And by the way, this artwork is part of uh, our friend and colleague Niels Navarro's work, and we'll visit Niels a little later. But that gives you an idea of Cuba. First, we'll visit Vinales. Um, we will have probably, on this little trip that I'm, I'm taking you for the next 40 minutes, 45 minutes, landed in Havana and driven a few hours to the Vinales area, a little bit to the west. It is known for its haystack mountains, its mogotes. For those of you who are geologically interested, and I know David indicated your geology trip this uh, very coming up very soon. These are limestone karst features. I think there are similar ones in Cambodia, Southeast Asia, Southern China, but these are unique geological structures. Correct me if I'm wrong. Soledad for unique structures for at least the Caribbean and most of this hemisphere. And as we go through Vinales, we may find some wonderful birds like the Cuban trogon on the left, hint, hint, black border, which means it's my photograph, which means it's not very good. And you have a hard time finding the Cuban trogon there, but I'll help you. Ta -da! There it is, the national bird of Cuba. Usually I have a point and shoot camera. That's about it, folks. I uh, either watch birds or photograph them, so I don't photograph them, really. Here on the right is our wonderful Cuban pygmy owl, fairly common uh, diurnal um, raptor uh, owl. Uh, you can find them during the daylight hours as well as at night. And uh, you, you, st you study and uh, look at the right places, you'll find them pretty quickly. And it's a joy to get these two uh, endemics the first day of your full ex experience in Cuba. In Vinales. And we may be lucky enough indeed to find yellow headed warbler on the left or West Indian woodpecker on the right. The West Indian woodpeckers in other places in the Caribbean, your yellow headed warbler is endemic to Cuba. But uh, with the right knowledge of the location, we get wonderful looks and wonderful photography with these two birds. Where do we stay? It really depends. Here's one place I stayed overlooking the town of Vinales. Here's the town of Vinales. Uh, this particular location, we had uh, 
uh, rooms with porches looking out over this, the town. It was particularly lovely. Vinales area is also well known for um, uh, tobacco, and this is a tobacco barn typical for the area. And it's a good place among the uh, mogotes to look for this particularly exciting uh, endemic bird, uh, the uh, Cuban solitaire. I say it's exciting not because it looks so wonderful, because it really looks like a Swainson's thrush or a hermit thrush that's gone through the wash and the dry, but it's wonderful because of its song. It is a spectacular singer that echoes throughout uh, the area. And you will undoubtedly hear it 20 minutes before you actually see it. It takes some time, but we actually do get a look at this wonderful endemic uh, thrush. This is a photo and you see the red border by a fellow by the name of Peter Kennerly, not my photo, and I can't take credit. Here's a wonderful place where we stay in the Vinales area, Las Terrazas. It's a reforestation project of many uh, square kilometers that started in 1968. It's a UNESCO biosphere reserve. We're viewing from our hotel room, looking down to where uh, some of the workshops are. This is a look of the lake next door. It's a wonderful place for birds. This is the hotel we stay at, uh, Hotel Moca. Uh, the wonderful thing, I keep on mentioning it, uh, the back of your hotel room in the bathroom is a giant window. Yes, you're safe. It's a giant window overlooking the valley. It's particularly lovely. And not only is it particularly lovely, it has feeders around here. And here we are with our friend Ernesto, and a group of us, half of our or half of our group that particular trip, going through our checklist of the bird scene that day. And I bring to your attention here, among one of our participants, the feeders, and this bird feeder right here that you can barely see. There it is, a good look at it. And if you look at the screen here, I'm showing it to you. This bird feeder is uh, available at a lot of dollar stores, and it's a dollar. Um, it may only be a dollar and common to us here, it's a rare ingredient, a rare, a rare uh, uh, product in Cuba, and we bring many of these with us. Uh, we spread them around among our participants. Each, each person takes about four or five of them and uh, makes um, it cheap, easy, wonderful gifts. If you mix one part sugar uh, with four parts water, it'll attract many hummingbirds, including some that we'll see shortly. It's a great experience in the Vinales area. We uh, get to see uh, three of the endemics there, olive cap warbler, which is very um, pine tree oriented, not like on, unlike, uh, who knows, everything from uh, Kirtland's warbler or, or pine warbler, whatever. But it's a very pine, war a pine oriented species. Uh, there's the Cuban vireo here which is a semi-endemic. It's occurred in a couple of other places. And one of my favorites, the Cuban green woodpecker, which is another endemic. And I always uh, enjoy the Cuban green woodpecker. It looks like it has its bill chiseled down. It's been tapping too much. It's got a short bill. And uh, here, of course, is the red-legged honeycreeper male in the lower right, which uh, occurs uh, throughout much of the Caribbean but it's always a wonder to, uh, to find. In Vinales, we, go, we stay at also, uh, among a, in a different part of Vinales, uh, the Via Saroa, which gives us access to other habitat, including as we leave the Vinales area, the orchid garden. Those of you who are uh, interested in the endemic plants of Cuba, this is a wonderful location uh, to study birds and to study uh, plants. We usually have a good guide who takes us through, who knows not only the plants, but the birds that come in and out, the endemic birds in particular. This is a particularly gaudy section, but I like the picture of it nonetheless. It's steep, but excellent birding. So now we're leaving Vinales, and we'll go from here and uh, take our bus all the way over here to Zapata Swamp. We will bypass Havana and go down there. It's about, you know, a half a day's drive. We stop at a couple of places, have lunch. It's an interesting uh, journey for us. Where we enter um, the National Park 
It's a biosphere reserve. It's a Ramsar site, as it indicates right here. Um, for me, it's not unlike habitat that shares different classifications. Uh, some of you may be familiar with, in my area, in Maryland, there's Chincoteague National Seashore, I'm sorry, Assateague National Seashore in the Eastern Shore, and Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge right next to each other. When you leave one and you enter the other, you're not quite sure what territory you're in. Or Merritt Island, Florida, near where Sole lives. There's a Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge and a Merritt Island National Seashore. Or, if you will, and have visited in the West and other locations, national parks, particularly national forests, particularly in the West, where they have embedded villages and towns uh, inside the national forest. That's not unlike the situation at, at Zapata Swamp, uh, where you have um, this kind of complex that works out. It really works out. It's not unlike, like I said, uh, national forest. So we're visiting the area and we stay there multiple days. Uh, this is the Bay of Pigs over here. Uh, Playa Larga is up at the top of the Bay of Pigs. Um, Playa Giron is over here where we visit. Bermeja is right over here, I believe. And Santo Tomas is in the interior. And we visit all those four places. Again, Playa Larga, um, Playa uh, Giron, and uh, Bermeja is just off the map. And this very important place here, Santo Tomas. So those are usually the four locations. Inside Playa Larga, that's our base of uh, operation. It's a lovely little town. It's prosperous, it's bustling. It's the hub of where we uh, are active. Here's some of our birders on the left and some of the activity. You can probably walk from one end to the other in about 20, 25 minutes. And you will see that it is prosperous insofar as about every other home uh, is a casa particular, a uh, homestay, bed and breakfast kind of operation like this one or that one. And uh, restaurants in between, like this tiki restaurant over here, uh, or places that are being constructed or repaired. Down here, if you can see close enough, we'll get a better view. Here's a casa particular that's finished over here. And here are our birders near Sole, by the way. And they're constructing a second layer, a second story uh, for uh, more rooms. Uh, they do quite well when there's not a pandemic. Like I said, there's every other, uh, every other building more or less is uh, a Casa Particular. Here's one Casa, whoops, excuse me. Here's one Casa Particular, Casa Ana. And here's our friend, Adrian at one of his facility, one of his feeder operations. A visiting birder brought him this feeder uh, and uh, gave it to him for his uh, use, like uh, this one I'm showing here from uh, Perky Pet. And uh, he set it up along with other feeders. He's cleaned up in his backyard, he's replanted, it's terrific. It's one of the best places or the best place in Playa Larga itself to sit down for hours if you wish to watch birds. And here's Adriana and myself. For example, we have here uh, black throated blue warbler and parallel warblers and yellow faced grass quit and uh, other birds. And you can sit there all day or for a couple of hours. If you don't want to come out with us for a morning of birding or an afternoon of birding, you want to take a break, you just walk over to Adrian's place, sit yourself down, and go see those birds, including, by the way, the very important endemic bee hummingbird, which we'll visit later. But we go from uh, Playa Larga into the swamp itself. We enter the National Park. Um, it's Everglades-like. It's dominated once you get into open areas by mangroves. Uh, it's not unlike certain locations in Florida, but here, my goodness, you have uh, flamingos. And uh, we have little clusters of flamingos. And even with the black border around you, you can see this is my photo. So we got close enough to see these babies. It's wonderful. And uh, there's often a number of snail kites going after the Pomacea snails in that area. Here are the male and the female snail, snail kites going after the snails. And uh, we will stop at uh, some little, and there are two or three towers 
uh, short towers, you know, the, the height of maybe a second story where you go and you can overlook the marshy areas, uh, the uh, mangroves. And if you're lucky enough, you'll see uh, Cuban blackhawk, an endemic bird, one of my absolute favorites. And you can see this on the left is my fabulous photo. Uh, but I even was able to uh, zoom up a bit and get a fairly decent shot of this wonderful wrap. And you have to separate that from the uh, snail kites. It's chubbier, it's a bootio. Uh, uh, don't be scared, uh, don't be fooled by a big looking snail kite, it may very well be your Cuban black hawk. And here's a, another look at a Cuban black hawk, a photo by Charles James Sharp. And here's our group plus another group. And I've taken the picture, you can see my shadow from the top of one of these little towers. The, the swamp is a great place, excuse me, this particular uh, national park section uh, is a great place to spend a good half day looking at the egrets, herons, um, limpkins, um, shorebirds, uh, ducks in the deep water, as well as these raptors, and a couple of um, and uh, clapper rails too. But we also go somewhat into the interior to go to the little refuge called at Bermeja, here we are leaving, but what did we leave? I'll, I'll show you what we left. We left a look at um, a Cuban parrot, and we left a little uh, blind, where a little blind wall where we uh, hid for a while to watch uh, bullheaded quail doves come in. And not just this one character I photographed, but the uh, rice is spread out when the birders show up, and within the hour there'll be a whole bunch of blue-headed quail doves at our feet on the other side of the wall. I have been there when the blue-headed quail doves become so tame that they come to our side of the wall and are picking at the, some of the dropped and leftover uh, over rice um, that's at our feet. It's truly stunning. Uh, one of the bir other birds we look for, of course, is the gray-fronted uh, quail dove, gray-fronted quail dove. This is a photo by one of our participants James Hill, who did uh, some very nice shot. He bent over and uh, took some terrific shots. And as we leave, uh, Bermeja, a little refuge there, um, near the road, we invariably find uh, Cuban parakeets um, coming in, coming out, maybe a small cluster of them. They're just wonderful. Then we'll leave that part, Bermeja, and go to another little town uh, called um, Palpite. And in Palpite, we go visit our friend Bernabe. He, here he is with his wife. And he had these uh, flowering bushes. I don't know the species or just escaped my, my head at the time, my mind at this moment, uh, where bee hummingbird is absolutely guaranteed. Not unlike Adrian's place, but Bernabe's location was historically for the last decade uh, or more, uh, the place to find easy looks at bee hummingbird. And you see once again, one of the feeders that we brought the Bernabe uh, on one of our trips. And here we are watching the birds coming to the feeder. And also speaking of the feeder, here we are in um, 2018 with our friend Ernesto. Here's Bernabe and yours truly. And we're giving him this very exciting, exotic looking feeder. It's called a humbug. It's, a, it's like a plate and a bowl with holes in it. And you open up the plate and you drop in the bowl, the, ups, the, the, the bowl with, that also has holes in it, um, overripe bananas. And that seems to produce fruit flies so that the hummingbirds not only have the nectar, but the fruit flies buzzing around this feeder. Here is my fabulous photo of a male bee hummingbird. You can see, you can almost see him uh, if you would. And, um, He's not only using the uh, nectar and sugar water feeders, he's also coming to other uh, operations like our humbug. Here's our humbug two years later. It's the Cadillac of bird feeders, or as I said two days ago, probably the Mercedes Benz. And here's a, a, a feeders. And here's a wonderful look at a male bee hummingbird. And here's a female bee hummingbird. Neither of those photos happen to be mine, but there you go. And here is our friend Bernabe holding up one of the feeders that we brought him. 
Here's another look at one of the feeders we bring. This is a whole dollar, maybe it's a dollar 25, I don't recall. We buy a dozen of these and they get put to good use by Bernabe, by uh, Idrien and others. Um, here he is holding it. And here's the picture that uh, shows and you see the green, green uh, frame around this. This shows how we interact with our colleagues and friends, the Cubans themselves who appreciate what they have and are joyful about sharing it. Uh, here's another photo, an excellent photo on the left by our friend Nana Royer. She took this in uh, 2018 of Bernabe or somebody else holding up one of these little, uh, one of these little feeders here. And on the right is a um, Pinterest uh, photo that I picked up. I borrowed, I don't know whose it is, but it shows you an idea of the size of this bee hummingbird, which is the smallest hummingbird in the world and by default, the smallest bird in the world, uh, in uh, there, there indeed. Also at Ben Nemes Place, you go to the back and there's some other feeders in, and it's almost guaranteed for you to see this very interesting Cuban Oriole, another endemic. This is a photo by uh, Francisco Vero Niesi. We leave um, Ben Nemes Place and we'll drive uh, to that location I brought to your attention, uh, the town of Santo Tomas. Here's the town itself. Uh, we pass a number of these places. It's a good field mark. If you see a flag and a little bust of the national hero and great poet, Jose Marti, you know that you're passing a school. And uh, in this case, it's the elementary school for the little town of Santo Tomas. And here's the uh, grocery store for Santo Tomas. And here's a wonderful mural of the Fermina, which is the Zapata wren. This is the place, this is the one species where we're looking for this endemic wren. Uh, and it's a pretty good place. You're almost guaranteed to see it. Uh, it takes some cooperation and advanced planning with our friends in Santo Tomas. And by the way, we always stop at the school. Here's the school room on the right. These are my photos. There are desks for all of five kids. They have their own teacher. You see her on the, on the left here. Uh, they, the town has a doctor we were visiting. Here's our friend, Michael. We're, we're discussing here a couple of the kids. Um, we always visit them. And uh, I'll tell you why when, after we go out to see our uh, attempt to find Zapata Red. How do we get there? We take this uh, uh, channel, a little canal at Santo Tomas. Um, it was built in 1919, I believe, by a fellow by the name Sales or Salas, I can't recall. Uh, and it was a way to get out to open water for easy access for goods coming out of Havana and elsewhere. And now it gives birders and naturalists easy access to many parts of the swamp, including the location where we're going to go to. We go out in these um, uh, rowboats that are now rowed. They're kind of almost Venetian style pushed by a pole. It's uh, an interesting 20 minute trip where we see some birds, including the endemic Zapata sparrow also, which we can often find. And we uh, step off and we go onto a little platform and we wait and we wait. And Ernesto pulls out of his pocket or uh, Michael pulls out of his pocket a little recorder and plays the song of uh, Zapata Wren. And if we're very patient and quiet, you'll get to see a couple of Zapata Wrens, including one I photographed beautifully. There they are somewhere in there. That's, that's one of my better photographs. That's the Zapata wren calling back at us, both left and right. Um, here's a much better picture. That's not mine, but it's David Beebe's. Um, it's a large wren. To me, it reminds me a little bit of a smaller cactus wren. Very lively once, once uh, he gets closer and responds. So we've seen that in a couple of other birds. It's a long day. We're on our way back the channel to the town of Santo Tomas. And Michael here gives our gondoliers, if I may call them that, Sole, 
uh, the people who helped us get out, he gives them a bunch of uh, hats. And what's in the hats? Well, they're bird hats and they're baseball hats. Um, Cuba is a great baseball loving country. I remember a bunch of years ago, right after the Cubs won the World Series, we had one um, Chicago a native, uh, she brought, she must have brought 20 Cubs hats. We figured this was the last chance we were going to get in our lifetime to give away Cubs hats under these circumstances. And it was uh, well received. And the Cubans who follow baseball uh, were very appreciative of the Cubs hats. Anyhow, enough said. We're exhausted. We go back. We go to our, our location, our little Casa Particular at our little um, homestay at uh, the beach, Playa Larga, and we go for a swim. Or we'll go for a different walk uh, through uh, the limestone area, uh, another walk, and we'll take a dip in one of the um, uh, limestone uh, cenotes. And uh, that's a very exciting and fun walk and a fun dip. I have many pictures of us swimming, but we'll pass those up because we're more interested in uh, bird life and nature. Is there bird life and nature in Havana? You bet there is. We drive back from Zapata Swamp to Havana, stopping once or twice, maybe to have lunch after we've packed up our various people from three or four different uh, homestays. And we take the bus back to Havana where we get to see birds and culture. I mean, there are different kinds of uh, repair going on here. Some beautiful old buildings that are constantly being repaired. Um, we go visit uh, and see in some of the squares, some of these grand old cars from the 50s. This is uh, Chevys and Fords and uh, Oldsmobiles, what have you. Uh, we also go to uh, the, the part of town where there is the former presidential palace. Indeed, we're staying by the presidential palace. It's now the uh, Museo de la Revolución, Museum of the Revolution. Uh, more on that a little later. Um, this is a typical street that looks like a Chevy, or unless it's an Oldsmobile, excuse me, I'd have to look a little closer, but it's a typical car. Uh, my wife and I, Yvonne, and I stayed here in one location and when we were uh, going to meet Sole at the swamp at Playa Larga. Uh, we stayed there two days, two nights, uh, and she arranged for us to stay at a Casa Particular. You can see over here the Capitol Dome of the Havana Capitol, the Capitolio, which is not unlike our own capital shape and style in Washington, D.C. In Havana, we also go visit this famous uh, Hotel Nacional for a couple of drinks and for the birds in there. The backyard of the Hotel Nacional is, can be full of, in the wintertime, can be full of warblers and orioles, as well as some endemics, not unlike this one here, which is the Cuban uh, version of the red-legged thrush. And this bird, as you can see, it has a black frame. This must have been at our feet, otherwise it would have been a terrible picture. It's at our feet, just bopping around, looking for worms, looking to see if we drop anything from the table. It's a good time. And while we're in Havana, we drop to see some of our other colleagues, like Alieni on the left and Lourdes on the right at the University of Havana. We gave them some of the coloring books that the, uh, that the Friendship Association's publishing arm had produced Cuban coloring books on Cuban birds, and we uh, gave them a whole, a whole packet there. Uh, by the way, you see our driver there, Monel, behind them. And they, they work at the, uh, uh, and teach biology um, and uh, interface with uh, the public and uh, natural history. Uh, here's the steps of the um, University of Havana. There's my daughter, Judith, is on our first trip to Cuba in 2006. And there she's reading a map and trying out how to find out how, to, how we walk from there to the next site that we want to see. But as I mentioned before, buildings are in a fascinating uh, either conditions of disrepair like this one here that's being rebuilt or completed repair like this one here on the left uh, looks gorgeous. Um, these are three, three or four buildings um, that are being repaired uh, along the uh, walk at the harbor. You can see them, uh, they retain the uh, character of the old buildings uh, from the 19th and early 20th century. And here's another way 
to retain the character. The front of the building is the old building. And the back of the building, the interior, the guts, so to speak, uh, is another building altogether. I think this might be a fancy hotel. Uh, I'm not uh, exactly sure. Maybe Sole could tell us uh, when we get to it. But as I said, this is the place where we stayed. Um, we stay at, we share three or four casas particulares, homestays. Um, Sole and I and Ivan, a couple of other people were in a three or four bedroom operation here on the fourth floor. And this, and we were right by the uh, Museo de la Revolucion that is uh, indicated here by the tank is a better look from our room. We're looking from here down to the uh, museum and we see some of the old and new cars mixed here. Some of the classics and some of the, <laughs> who knows, Japanese and, and Chinese and French cars that currently inhabit the place. So are there birds to see? Is there nature? Yep, there's plenty, uh, especially near the harbor. We can go look at um, brown pelicans or royal terns or Antillian palm swifts here uh, or um, Cuban uh, martins. Uh, these two, of course, are endemics uh, to the island. And from my room, my hotel room, I have seen uh, roosting peregrine falcons there in wintertime, uh, picking out the uh, Eurasian collared doves that have, yes, arrived in, many years ago, arrived in Havana. But a great place to see these birds and is uh, our, our walk and our drive around town, uh, the Castillo uh, at the mouth of the harbor, the Malecon, the walkway on also at the, at the harbor. It's a great place to walk to see historic locations, including, by the way, that's where the American Embassy is, right across the street. When I took this photo, the American Embassy was probably uh, to my back and a little bit to my right. But we also go to the um, Jardin Botanico Nacional, the National Botanical Gardens. It's about uh, 600 hectares with 4,000 plants of species. It's 25 miles outside the center of the city. It's rarely visited. It's really in interesting. It's under visited. I've never seen more than one or maybe two other buses in the whole place besides our bus. Um, and we do, um, we shuttle between buses and walking and walking and buses and we go through the park. Uh, we might, or we almost invariably see uh, the meadowlark. And this is a Cuban subspecies. The Cuban ornithologists are insistent that this is going to be um, a next, uh, their next endemic species. And it's not uh, simply a, a Cuban version of the American meadowlark. It's uh, Eastern meadowlark. It's their own. In any case, I'll leave that argument to somebody else. But here's a good look at the uh, Japanese garden section of the uh, Jardin Botanico Nacional. There also, invariably you find the two forms of um, American kestrel. These are actually Cuban kestrels. They are non-migratory. They stay in uh, Cuba. And there are two flavors, if you will. There's the rufous-breasted one and the white-breasted one. Here's, and uh, here's, here's both of them. Uh, James Hill, um, I believe, took, our, took this photo, uh, one of our participants. And you see in the background is uh, my first, this was my first trip to the Jardin where I walked around every place. Here's a motorcycle, it's a Soviet era motorcycle. There's lots of Soviet era vehicles still existing, Ladas and more. This was a motorcycle with a sidecar and the owner uh, who works as one of the uh, attendees at the Jardin uh, was repairing it. And this is another look at the um, pond at the Japanese gardens where we have uh, common gallinule and where around the, the edges uh, we have smooth bill avies. And we also see great lizard cuckoo, another fabulous bird, large, it must be 18, 24 inches including that humongous um, uh, tail of it, of, uh, that it uses to fly and navigate. So those are the three places that you invariably will visit no matter who you, no matter who you go with, with whom you go. Uh, that is uh, to say Vinales, Zapata Swamp and Havana. 
those are standard places, but now we'll visit quite quickly, very quickly, uh, four other locations. Guanajaca Rives on the east, the north coast locations here by Calle Coco and Calle Guillermo, uh, Baracoa on the, I'm sorry, um, Guanajaca Rives is on the west, excuse me, uh, the north coast uh, resorts, Baracoa on the extreme east, and around here, Topes de Coyentas near Trinidad. So we'll do it in that order. We'll go with Guanajaca Rives, North Coast, Baracoa, and Topes. First, Guanajaca Rives is a famous place for people who are interested in fishing and most importantly, snorkeling. It has wonderful beaches, great um, coral reefs. Uh, snorkelers and uh, skin divers love the place. Here's uh, Maria Lagorda, Mary the Chubby. Uh, this is the location, and this is one of the uh, particular, um, this is right next to our hotel. Uh, it's a great place, a location for their snorkeling. And here's the center, of, a visitor center at the park uh, at Guanajaca Rives. And here are banders. They're banding the birds that come south from Florida, reach Cuba, fly eastward in Cuba, and launch themselves off of Guanajaca Rives to reach the Yucatan Peninsula. And um, it's, it's really a very exciting thing. Here's our, here's our buddy Ernesto. And they're, I think they're banding a female. It could be an indigo bunting or a blue grosbeak. beak. I'm not exactly sure. I can't see right now, but that doesn't matter because we're also giving uh, goodies away to some of our friends and colleagues there. You see the green border. This is Osmani, Osmani Borrego. He's the SNAP assistant director of uh, the Guanajuato Rivas National Park. SNAP is their system of national parks. We're giving him feeders, like the ones I were te was telling you about. Here's a bunch of feeders. Here's some, some um, hummingbird calendars I got. And here are a bunch of, uh, I believe, Sole's uh, coloring books. We, and we gave him some binoculars. And here's our group, or part of our group. Um, near our hotel watching uh, orioles and other birds uh, in the trees where we're, where we're staying. So much for Guanajaca Rives, we're gonna go to the North Coast. It's a long drive from Guanajaca Rives, past Vinales, past Havana, past Veradero, past the turnoff for, um, for the swamp to uh, here. It's a full day's drive, basically, where we stop multiple times for some almost a full day's drive, casual. We stop for birding and snacks and bathroom breaks. And we go here to the one of the uh, bigger um, and more interesting resorts. There are about four resorts here on the North Coast. This is Cayo Coco Resort. Uh, they're very beautiful. They're, they attract tourists. Uh, here's the hotel we stayed at at Cayo Coco. I like to go there, if only to show people the contrast between Cuba as we've seen it and this kind of location. This kind of location is suited and created for tourists and for hard dollars or hard euros. The people who come here, these are resorts. They're package deals very often. They might as well be in Aruba or Barbados or Nassau or uh, Punta Cana in the Dominican Republic, they just happen to be in Cuba. Uh, they fly in, they buy a package deal, they stay a week, they have a lovely time, they fly home. They never see Havana, they never see real Cuba, but they have a good time. And it's important for the country because it brings in tourist dollars. That the place is packed with people from France, Italy, Great Britain, Israel, Canada in particular. And these are all inclusive packages. We just visit for a couple of days. I'd like to show uh, the, the folks what we are looking at and that they appreciate um, the situation. But we also get some nifty birds that are easy to find along the North Coast and more difficult to find elsewhere. Most importantly, the Bahama Mockingbird, and I'll mention that in a few minutes. Uh, also, this great West Indian whistling duck and the uh, Cuban gnat catcher. It's not un unlike our uh, blue gray gnat catcher, but you see that little black semicircle behind the eye. That's an indication of, of what it is. And once again, one of my favorites, 
uh, the great lizard cuckoo. But there's constant development that Kayokoka and the other resorts, if only to bring in hard money. The Cuban government, the Cuban uh, people need hard money, buy stuff on the international market. And to get that, they have development. They're developing more resorts. This was a once a little road that winded through mangroves and edges where we used to find Bahama mockingbirds, but now it's a big wide road to a new development where they're gonna build some new buildings. Uh, this is one of the drivers and one of the trips I took, not one of the drivers, he's one of the uh, uh, people who comes with the driver, let's put it that way, uh, that some of the operations have. Uh, this is, uh, Ray Dell is his first name, we called him Ray, and he goes by the name of Ray, he spoke English, he knew most of the birds, he was very good, his driver was very good, but Ray had a little pair of almost opera glasses, you know, five power little jobs around his neck. Well, we gave him these um, binoculars here, and he gave his binoculars to the bus driver who was very observant also. I mean, it's part of the sharing process. But this road also you know, represents, as I said, uh, development. Uh, this I think was in 2016. Um, Baracoa is the next location, all the way on the east side, it's one of Sole's favorite places. It's a very interesting city, old city, beautiful, clean, and uh, healthy. Here's a view of downtown or overlooking a part of, this, a part of town into the harbor, the old harbor. It's a beautiful location, but it's also the entree and the, the uh, jumping off point for the National Park, Alejandro Humboldt National Park, a uh, uh, giant park of 275 square miles. It's one of the last locations where the Cuban subspecies of ivory-billed woodpecker, probably extinct now, was found, I believe, into the 70s and 80s. I could be corrected. And we have friends and colleagues there. Here's um, Giovanni, who's the park director. He's holding one of the one of the perky pet feeders we gave him, and one of the little ones that I showed you. Here I am um, with th these fellows. Uh, here's our friend who goes by the nickname El Indio. He's a ranger at the park holding a hummingbird uh, calendar. I think this trip was in January or February, so the calendars were still good and holding some uh, bottle hummingbird feeders. And that's Noel Elvis, who's a specialist in the palomita snails. As our group walks through the Humboldt National Park, we sometimes need some help. You can't see it very well here, but we have to cross a river that was maybe about eight to 12 inches high. The, and we had uh, uh, Sole and Ernesto prearranged for there being an ox cart to meet us and to carry us across. Uh, some of us waded through, it was lots of fun, but we had terrific birds there. Uh, among the birds we saw, Cuban green emerald, the other <coughs> endemic hummingbird of the island, which we've already seen multiple times, but it's a big job, it's beautiful. Cuban parakeet, which we saw before, but most interestingly, the polymet polymeta snails in that part of Cuba, which are truly unique. Another species we look for is the giant kingbird. It looks like the great kingbird of the Caribbean and uh, South Florida for that matter, but it looks like a great kingbird on steroids. It's really chubby, it's got a big bill. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a serious uh, fly cat or wasp catcher in any case. And then we go back to our hotel here in Baracoa. And by the way, we had the humid emeralds uh, coming to these bushes here. You can see the flowers there. And we distribute um, to the librarian at the town, uh, our, our friend uh, from the library, um, coloring books and calendars and other things that Sole um, arranged. But the town is also a <clears throat> location, unfortunately, in a position where the hurricanes invariably hit Baracoa. And here's the results of hurricanes from a couple of years before I took the shots. It's um, tough and it's really tough for these buildings to be repaired given uh, the uh, 
a low number of um, construction uh, facilities and equipment that they have. Another little sad thing about the, the situation is that it's one of the locations for, and we'll mention this multiple times, the bird trade. Here's the bird trade. These are two guys walking uh, through the streets, selling or delivering. I think these were grass quits. I don't know what was in there, but the two cages with birds, wild birds. It's um, illegal in the, uh, in the country, but you know, it's like, you know, what's illegal in the United States? Uh, jaywalking is illegal in the United States too, but it happens. What can I say? And here we have some of our uh, friends, Carlos Pena here in the hat, in the red hat, and his sister, um, Lourdes Pena. Um, we're at the um, Holguin Historical Museum. This is a few miles, a number of miles to the west of Baracoa, but it's still in the region. And uh, she's explaining to Sole, one of our participants, and our friend Ernesto, the difficulty they have teaching the students or the challenge that they have teaching the students uh, about the bird trade. And the students are very receptive. It's their parents who are the problem. And here is a Lord of this with one of the one of the posters that they created. Here's another bird poster about the, the birds being more beautiful when they're free and not in caged. But here you go. The, the bird trade is uh, scattered throughout the country. Here's Morn Holguin. This, I think, is a Cuban um, bullfinch. Here's a Playa Larga on the left, another Cuban bullfinch at the city of Santiago. It's a yellow-faced grassbird on the right. Here's back in Santa, here's in Santa Clara, a, a Cuban bullfinch. Um, and another Cuban bullfinch in Santa Clara. Different, same species, um, different location, different home. The sad thing also is that when a number of these people, and Soli will mention it, when a number of these uh, people uh, who open up uh, casas particulares, their, their homestays, or they have um, restaurants, um, they um, display their increased uh, tourist access by, unfortunately, getting some birds and putting them in a cage. And we have to counter that. And Soli will mention that a little later, I'm sure. Here's in, in Havana itself, a, a Cuban grass quit, semi-endangered now. It's so beautiful. It's a great singer, but it's semi-endangered because because it's it's suffering from the bird trade. And here on the right is one of our, I put it in quotes, our indigo buntings. Um, so that's what our little visit to the Baracoa Holguin area. And we'll go to Topes, a quick visit to Topes here in the Trinidad region. It's a wonderful location in the National Reserve Park of Escambre Mountains. It's very hilly. It's got some interesting uh, old structures here built in the 50s that served as um, um, spas and restaurants and gyms and cabaret. But after the revolution, it became a location for tuberculosis patients looking for clean air. And it's currently used for other medical purposes. This was our transportation between locations when we attended the Birds Caribbean meeting at Topes. And it was a very exciting meeting with hundreds of people and dozens of Cubans, hundreds of people from the United States and the Caribbean uh, discussing bird education, bird conservation, birding, and the interaction of all of those elements. The place is lovely, wonderful mountains, interesting climbing. Here we are leaving one of our little field trips during the Birds Caribbean meeting uh, as we are going uphill and downhill on one of the big roads. And we see some great birds, like one of my favorites, the Cuban toady. Must be about, you know, that size. It's, it's lovely. Uh, or, as I mentioned before, the Cuban grass quit, a great bird. But one of the things we did, and you'll see the green border around it, we brought lots of stuff to leave with our colleagues there. We brought three or four pairs of binoculars right here. We brought lots of feeders of different sizes and shapes. We brought a camera. Uh, we even brought this um, uh, bag, this camping, this Coleman um, shower bag so that our friends on the North Coast could use it to attract birds. 
How does a shower bag attract birds? By having it drip very, very slowly because the North Coast is wonderful for migrants coming from the United States, but terrible for the migrants themselves because there's very little fresh water. And one of the locations at the North Coast, many of the locations that our friends run on the North Coast are um, water feeders uh, for the birds uh, that migrate through to come and, and they're, they're magnets uh, for birds, they're terrific. And you'll see here, Ken Kaufman's uh, Guide to the Birds of North America. And this is his uh, Spanish translation. And he brought this for our friends. So wrapping up this part, one of the lessons that we can pull out of uh, this experience and this little look at Cuba and Cuban visitation of, uh, of uh, Guanajuato Vives and Havana and uh, the swamp and Topes and Baracoa and the North Coast, well, what do we learn? Well, who can take you? There are a number of folks who can take you. Some are highly recommended and do a great job, like um, Soleil's Friendship Association, and she will tell you more about that. Our friend, uh, Gary Markowski, runs the Caribbean Conservation Trust. He always brings equipment also. Uh, our friends from Birds Caribbean have a small trips there, and also our friends from uh, Optics for the Tropics, Joni Ellis, whom you'll see in a few minutes, she runs them. And how do you get around? Well, we get around on a bus like this, and it's Chinese made, it holds about 25 people, and we have uh, no more than 12 or 13 in the bus because we wanna have room and we wanna have a good time. Uh, and the driver is extremely important. He is our friend Sobe. He's our preferred driver. We have him most of the time, unless he's otherwise occupied. You can see the little pin he has here. This is a pin, we bring dozens of these. It's a pin with a Cuban flag and an American flag. And uh, Sobe wears it. And, and all of our hosts get one of these. Uh, what we do is we give out three or four pins to each of our, each of our participants and say, don't go home with these. I mean, put one on yourself, but give them to somebody else, one of your, one of your hosts at your homestay or, or somebody at a restaurant or who, whoever, it helps create better relations. If you wanna find out more about Cuba before, you, before this pandemic is over and you get to go with uh, Sole and us or Gary or Joni or somebody else, look up this, you can see this for free. It's a wonderful video by nature called Cuba, the Accidental Eden. It, it, it's the nature series. It, it shows um, uh, the wonders of natural Cuba from, this, from the coral reefs to the mountains. It also shows some of the problems they're having. One of the, one of the lessons is that, that uh, they explained in 2014, I think when this film was made, was that the Chinese are ready to come in and build dozens of golf courses um, as soon as uh, the country is ready and uh, to increase the uh, amount of hard currency coming in. Kind of sad, but uh, to be expected, see Cuba before that happens. Here's a fine book. Um, one of the best, I would say the best, our friends Niels Navarro here signing the book. It's his book, Endemic Birds of Cuba, that's published by uh, the uh, printing subsidiary of the Friendship Association. And lo and behold, the uh, creation of not one version in English, but a version in Spanish. What's the use of having a book in English when the people that you want to get to learn about their, their own birds and the beauty and the protection of the birds speak Spanish? So it's a fine book in both languages. Uh, you pay a little extra for the English ones so Sole can distribute the ones in Spanish for free uh, to our counterparts in Cuba, and it's well worth it. It's well constructed. It's all written and artwork by Niels, plus Soleil's impeccable editing. But it's a fine book. That plus your North American field guide is all you need when you, when you go to Cuba. Uh, here's another good book, both in English and in Spanish. It's the classic, Birds of Cuba. Um, I, it's Princeton University Press or uh, Cornell University Press. I know Cornell did the Spanish version again. I think they ran out of this one but it's a classic and very good. And I also mentioned Ken Kaufman's Field Guide to Birds of North America in Spanish. Guía de Campo de los Aves de Norte América. 
he did this specifically for our Mexican counterparts um, because it's all of North America and th that's where there's most of the overlap. But, you know, if this guide is good in, in uh, Florida, it's good in Cuba and it is good in Florida. It covers all the birds of Florida and lots of the birds of Cuba except for the endemics. So it's a wonderful guide. P.S. Ken, in his um, wonderful character, uh, paid off, paid for this himself uh, to get 2,000 of these uh, printed. Uh, God bless him. It's a fine book. And here's the introduction in the English version to get to know what the crown is in Spanish. You'll get to know some of the parts of the bird, corona or espalda in the back, or blanco for the flank or the side, you know, or Punta de la Ala for wingtip, you know, all over right. You get to know this stuff. It's uh, part of your experience in Cuba. And here's the wonderful uh, coloring book that I mentioned multiple times that uh, Ediciones Nuevos Mundos, uh, the Friendship Association a publishing outlet, uh, did and has distributed across the country for the kids. And she'll tell you more in a few minutes. Here's some of our interaction. Uh, the uh, Friendship Association's publishing arm also does an annotated checklist of the birds of Cuba by Niels Navarro. It's terrific. And here we are in a particularly Cuban situation. Um, Sole and I are on the bus leaving, I think, uh, the North Coast or, or Playa Larga. I can't remember where we were at the time, but we're on our way to Havana. And here's Ernesto and our friend Joni from Optics to the Tropics leaving the Havana airport and coming toward the sun. And we're passing each other, but we decided, we called each other and figured out where we would meet on the Autopista Numero Uno, the, the highway number one. And we stopped there to greet each other. But not only that, um, we wouldn't need more coloring books uh, like Sole has here. We wouldn't need two pairs of extra binoculars and a couple of feeders. We gave them to Ernesto and Joni to be in part of their supply of stuff that they're giving out. I mean, one hand washes the other. This is what happens. It's all creative. It all helps create uh, interaction and wonderful teamwork and uh, good friends in one of our closest countries that we'll be able to visit more and more. But having said all of this, at breakneck speed, I hand the baton over to Sole to tell us about a couple of the projects that uh, the Friendship Association and Ediciones Nuevos Mundos has engaged in in uh, parts of Cuba. Over to you, Sole. Okay. Um, thank you, Paul. Uh, you've said it all. You've said you've said it all. It, can you hear me? Just raise your hand. Can you? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, you really have covered just about everything in terms of projects. You see on the screen uh, our coloring book. Uh, which is handed out to uh, children through the ornithologists uh, field programs, or they work in the schools and then they take the kids on field trips. And you see here one of their field trips with, um, with the kids and they teach to the coloring book uh, because the coloring books are very educational. And you can also see t-shirts which were made by um, Optics for the tropics, uh, mas libres, mas bellas. They're, they're, the freer, the more, the more free the bird is, the more beautiful it is. Protect it, protect them, and uh, that's the 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 motto that our the national campaign to uh, to keep and get uh, the birds, illegal birds, out of cages. And uh, so we have stickers, we have posters, we have um, murals on the walls and all kinds of activities for the kids, which you can see here. So slowly, slowly, we're getting the message across. Um, and then I think that we'll see now a, a, the Cape Cod group um, donated some, mon some money for equipment to be sent to, um, to this project in the eastern part of Cuba. Um, and we brought, we bought and then brought uh, binoculars. Paul donated this uh, scope, this spotting scope, 
Yeah, and, uh, if I could add, this was this was one given to me by an acquaintance from the uh, Annapolis area Maryland Bird Club. It was an old bowel scope. I mean, it's it's built to last. It was from the 70s or 80s. It's terrific. It's small. It's handy. I saved it for two or three years, <laughs> waiting for the right opportunity and the right project to bring this to the right people. And of course, this was the right experience. And so, so yeah. made it possible yeah. for this scope to get a new life. Right. So, uh, so this is these this, these particular photos show um, uh, projects in uh, that are out of Santiago de Cuba, which is another place where we might go. We didn't really have time to talk about it here. And the T-shirt uh, here, the, the yeah, logo this, here, sorry. This is the same logo. Uh, actually, that design was done by a Cuban ornithologist, Mejor Better's flying. Um, but the Cubans themselves made those t-shirts. They, they had a very limited funds, but they made the t-shirts and handed them out to the kids. Um, what's the, do we have any more? Yeah, oh, this, yeah. I love this, this is great. This is one of the murals that they made, uh, again, for this project of, of, of protecting the birds in the wild. And, uh, and this also was part of the Cape Cod uh, donation, and you can see. I don't know if there's a closer one, but you can see. Whoops! You can see the the Cape Cod logo over on the right that that says Cape Cop because uh, they didn't know how to spell it. Oh, here it is, Cape Cop Bird Club. But we thought it was so cute, we should leave it like that, and not change it. <laughs> so, uh, but again, this is uh, this is the whole uh, the whole idea of of um, keeping birds in the wild. That's just and one that's of the many, many programs that, that we've helped support. But it's the Cubans themselves that are here's some, uh, doing the mural. Um, and this is Ines uh, on the left. And she is the mover and shaker of the Eastern part of Cuba uh, in terms of conservation. They plant mangroves, they, they do all kinds of uh, of events, they they um, they did a whole thing of making kites in the shape of different endemic birds, and then flying them in front of the uh, Moncada uh, barracks, very famous museum. And they did a made a video, and lots of publicity on television. So they're doing as much as they possibly can. And even with COVID, they've continued their work. They I don't have photos of those now, but with masks on and everything, they still are doing the coloring books. Uh, what's another thing that we bring are crayons because crayons and the paint, all of that paint was brought from the United States. Um, I brought pigments and then we made the paint there. Uh, but but uh, it's very difficult to get supplies. So we, we bring as much as we can. And that's one of the things that the delegations do is they fill their suitcases with donations. And there is uh, our group. And there's Yvonne. Yep, there's Joni in the background. Yeah, Joni in my the back. Yvonne and myself. Yeah. Ernesto, yep. his wife, yep. other Norte Americanos. And yep. here's Sole with a Cuban parrot. Oh, let me just say that, that that was a wounded parrot that is, or, or, how do you say it? A, a parrot are. that was we, rehab. Okay. And so yeah. otherwise, I would never, ever do that. But uh, it was a a, a parrot that had been rehabbed and couldn't fly, so. And, uh, and this kind of wraps us up. I mean, in this, I hope you get a good feeling, not only for the birds, uh, not only for the people in the locations, but the conservation and education connections. And the fact that we Americans yeah. have the opportunity, especially now in the new administration, to visit Cuba soon uh, and, and continue uh, to make a difference. Um, we have colleagues and counterparts and wonderful people, only some of whom you've, you've been able to uh, be introduced to here. Uh, I, I remember the birds' names and, the, and their habitats. Uh, Sole knows all the people <laughs> and their habitats and their habits and their contributions. <laughs> and combined, this is uh, a real creative experience. And uh, we welcome you to be part of it. Let me give you one warning before we go next time. I'm getting a notice that my internet is unstable. 
So if I leave before we're really finished, it's not that I'm ignoring you, it's that I've gotten cut off for some reason. But I think, David, we could go for any questions, if anybody has any questions. Okay, well, that's great. Uh, why don't we, uh, why don't share the screen? We're gonna promote everybody up to, we'll start with people that have, raise your hand if you have a question, we'll get you first and, and uh, we'll have a little conversation. Um, so, I don't see any people. Yeah, hang on. No, we're gonna, I don't know we're how gonna, to do um, that. Chat, maybe chat. Let me okay. preempt the first question, if I might. Sure. And I showed you three different kinds of feeders. You know, the little hand one that people had, and this one from Perky Pet, and this one from the dollar store. I mean, we, we, why would we? What's the difference between these two? We learned what the difference was. We know that the difference between them is $7. <laughs> that is to say, this was a buck and this is eight bucks. Why would we ever want to bring an $8 uh, feeder uh, when we can get plenty of $1 ones? Well, we learned from Ben and Emmy that this is a wonderful feeder, a wonderful feeder, this $1 one for the Cuban um, emerald. Uh, but the little, Bee Hummingbird has a hard time getting to the uh, well uh, uh, and reaching all of the uh, nectar. And this is much preferred because the well is much shallower here. And uh, there you go. That's why this one is much more preferable to for the uh, areas where there are green, excuse me, um, a bee hummingbird. So that's you know part of the interaction and, and experience and learning. So if we're giving feeders to people where there are bee hummingbirds, we make sure we give them uh, the shallow uh, ones from Perky Pet. If we're doing elsewhere on the island, we give them the other ones which are cheaper and the well is deeper, or we give them these, which is good in either case. But that's just a fascinating thing we learned in the interaction uh, with our friends and colleagues. Over to questions. Why don't you uh, commandeer us, David? Yeah, well, I just said uh, there's a couple comments in the chat that just um, really uh, acknowledge your conservation efforts there that are that are pretty good. Um, does anybody want to ask a question? Are we all pretty shy? <laughs> I don't see any. You can unmute yourself and ask the question if you like. So. One of the questions I had, um, Paul, was, you know, basically, what is the cost for a, uh, for a, you know, a trip for a, what do you usually go for 10 days or a week or 10 days or? Over to Sole, over to you, Sole, you know, you can, that's your field. <laughs> um, 10 day, uh, a week is very short. Yeah. A very short. I mean, you could do a, sh you know, you could do a kind of a quick trip in a week. You might be able to go to two places rather than four, yeah. but um, the 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 shortest time I would do is eleven or twelve days. Now, okay. right now, unfortunately, there are the flights to Cuba um, <clears throat> primarily because of our former president are only once a week. So, <laughs> you either go for a week or you go for two weeks <laughs> because yeah. it. But that's supposed to change soon. That should change soon. So, um, so that may or may not be a, a problem. Um, also, the former president made going to a number of the hotels and restaurants illegal because they're government hotels or hotels rather that are run by a subsidiary of the armed forces of Cuba. So, I mean, and that's going to be undone, um, we expect soon. And we're always able to get around that by not staying at the hotel, but staying at those homestays right. nearby. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The Hotel Mocha at, uh, is, is a particularly nice place to stay and but we'll be able to go back and, and, and go to uh, Casas Particulares if we have to. But we right. think that that's gonna change. Yeah, right now, a lot of hotels are off limits. Yep. But we like, staying in, we like staying in bed and breakfast. You're helping the civil society you're helping the individuals, and and uh, and and you get to know, you get to meet a normal Cuban and have an interaction with them. So we 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 really like 
like it's not that's not a big problem. It's not a big problem. Okay, we have a question, so that about how people could donate. So you can purchase uh, materials to bring to Cuba the next time you go? Okay, um, we are a 501c3. That means we're tax exempt charity and donations are tax, are tax uh, how do you say it? You can, you can right. deduct, take, your taxes, deduct yeah. them from your taxes. Yeah. yeah, so that's not a problem. Uh, you can make a donation to the Friendship Association. You can say, I want this to, you know, to, I don't want you to buy binoculars or I want you to buy uh, whatever. Coloring or, books, yep. Coloring books, it's anything that, you know, obviously if it's within our scope, it's, you can, you can just say what you would like to happen with it. And that's easy once we start going, of course. We don't send anything. It's impossible mm -hmm. to send right. anything. Nope. You, yes. So we- and Hand carry. Hand carry everything. So the best way to do it would be, is it Ruth? Is the best way would be for Ruth to come with us. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll fill, way, fill her suitcase. Well, she can have one suitcase of her own and we'll have another suitcase filled with binoculars and medical supplies and whatever else. And Sully, you neglected to say, to answer David's first question about how much does this cost? Oh, I did that on purpose. <laughs> 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 I, would, I would say, uh, I don't know because I don't know what the prices of flights are gonna be right now. Uh, we are, the, uh, our trips are among the least expensive. Would you agree, mm -hmm. Paul? Of all Absolutely. trips and the most interesting, uh, and most exciting, and most adventuresome. Um, but I think the last trip that we, the one that we have uh, organized for February is about 3,000 something, yeah. 3,000 something. But again, if it's going to be more than 12 days, you know, then that'll be some more. And you leave from And as Miami, I say, that's the least. No, um, we try to leave from Orlando. We Orlando. could in the old days, like last year, we could go from Orlando, <laughs> Fort Lauderdale, or Miami. Okay. So it could like be any Fort of- I like Fort Lauderdale the best. I, I like Orlando the best, even though the airport's uh, too <laughs> crazy, but it's closer to me and I could drive down with, without killing myself, right? So, so but oh, Fort Lauderdale, Orlando, or Miami. So anybody from Massachusetts would just fly directly into that place, you know, maybe spend the night. We have a really nice hotel in Miami. That's shuttles is back and yep. forth. Yeah, and yep. that's all, that's all. Everything is included except getting to the jumping off spot. Uh, uh, um, but everything else, hotel except it, the booze. booze we don't. Your we don't. We don't include booze. <laughs> <laughs> we might give you a welcome cocktail. Let's put it that way. <laughs> But booze is booze is on your own. That that's uh, that's and if you want to buy art or anything like that, of course that's on your own. Let me give you a footnote. When Sole said we will, you know, bring you have one bag and we'll fill up the other bag, and you know, don't worry about that. We had a, a our friend Joni, who shall go, who shall go nameless, uh, um, unfortunately put a whole bunch of binoculars in one in one bag. Uh, yeah, that's what and I'm going through Cuban customs, they say, "Oh, you can't do this. You're going to sell this stuff. They're all brand new. Uh, you can't bring this into the country. We're taking them." So we wisely distribute the stuff mixed in with everybody's toilet kit or underwear or what have you. Yeah. We also, yeah. I remember getting a letter from Lourdes in Eleni about the coloring books. So that was on the letterhead of the. Havana, the University Havana. of Havana, saying that we were bringing in coloring books for distribution, for education. And I waved this to them when they asked me, and they said, fine. Yeah. But, uh, you know, don't do anything uh, ridiculous in terms of packing. But, yeah, don't, uh, try, uh, don't try it on your own. Uh, we, <laughs> we have pretty, we have a 100% record. Joni has, has, had, has had to pay customs once in a while, but 
we so far for 20 years, we have not paid a penny or, and we've never had to bribe anybody, but, um, but we're very careful. And we, and we as, as Paul said, we distribute things in, this, in the various suitcases. Yeah, first night at the hotel in, in um, Fort Lauderdale, Orlando, Orlando. we just start spreading stuff. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. That's the way you do it. It's a human experience. <laughs> yeah, we had just a couple more comments that um, I do have. I will be sending out an email tomorrow with a recording of this uh, talk, okay. and it'll have the website for the friends, and um, and so you'll be able to uh, communicate that way. And also, um, um, a re yeah, the recording and and the in the links, so you'll be okay. able to to uh, learn a little bit more. We had one one comment from. Uh, from Jeff Green that uh, he saw a lot of turkey vultures over Havana in 2019. Um, can you speak to the, to the presence in large numbers in the city? Uh, I, Paul could probably answer, but I would say they're just hungry. <laughs> the, the, I, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're all over the country. They're, they're yeah. all over the country, but- um, There are no black vultures. Black vultures are accidental in, uh, in oh, Cuba, really? but turkey they're vultures very are- Very rare, yeah. yeah. Yeah, turkey vultures are, are, are common. Just about, uh, just about everywhere, as I recall. Yeah. And to me, yeah. the more interesting thing in Havana was the uh, the presence of Eurasian collar doves, which are, you know, which are peregrine food. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, if somebody said, Cuba, what do you need most? Um, everything. Right now, it is. You can't even answer that question right no. now. You can't even answer the question. Food, everything, everything is in short supply. Everything, food, so, medicines, analgesics, uh, pain medicines, shampoo. antibiotics, everything, shampoo. Uh, we don't even think about deodorant anymore because that's a luxury, uh, yeah. but every, everything is in short supply. So you have to kind of triage what's the most important thing that you could, you know, cause you're only allowed 50 pounds. So, yeah. You know, we tend to think that um, we tend to think that education is very important. Um, so, oh, I don't bring food. I bring snacks for the people on the bus because they they tend to they're they're not quite used to going without food. But but we don't. I don't bring like ten pounds of rice because I figured no. they're going to have to figure it out somehow in, in a larger scale. It's just not. Let me Not give you it. let me give you a rice note, if I may. Oh, you're a rice man. That's right. I'm a rice man, and I mean they, they grow rice in Cuba, and, and you see them drying rice on the road, which is, is another story. But yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's another story. Let me give you a rice story. Um, I have experienced and and gone to rice country in in Louisiana in particular. In particular, the, the Yellow Rails and Rice Festival with Louisiana rice farmers every every uh, November. It's a wonderful small festival, and we deal with the rice farmers there. And uh, I know uh, two or three Republican rice farmers who have visited Cuba who are desperate to sell their rice to Cuba. Uh, that is to say, they want it's a short half day, three quarter day trip between uh, New Orleans and Havana by boat. And they want to sell their rice, but they're not allowed to sell their rice because of U.S. Uh, U.S. regulations. And um, if the Cubans want the Louisiana rice, they have to pay in it cash in advance. So the Cubans are getting their rice from da 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 da. da. What do you think that they're getting their rice from Vietnam? Vietnam, yeah. Vietnamese rice we're getting in Cuba. And it comes all the way from the other side of the world through the Panama Canal, the whole bit. I mean, it is so dumb. And uh, let's hope that uh, this, uh, our, my, <clears throat> my Republican farmer friends in Louisiana uh, can uh, sell their rice to Cuba uh, on, uh, pretty soon <laughs> because uh, both sides will, will uh, benefit. Let's put it that way. An upset. Right. right. All right. Well, um, anybody else have any other questions? And again, we'll send you out the link to the friends and uh, that'll be coming tomorrow. And um, I'm not seeing any more. So 
I really appreciate the conversation today and we will um, see all of our members next month for Earn of the Blanks talk on uh, what we missed, what the camera missed or the camera caught.